Hello and welcome to another edition of the Sporting Kansas City Show on your home for SKC Soccer, Sports Radio 810 WHB, wherever you get your podcasts and wherever you stream your video content. We are presented, as always, by the delicious taste of Michelob Ultra. It's only worth it if you enjoy it. My name is Nate Bucati. To my left is Ali Trost. To my right is Jacob Peterson. And we have a big show coming up for you today. Coming up, we're going to talk with the captain, Johnny Russell. He's got his family in town from Glasgow, Scotland. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about his big game-winning goal against Real Salt Lake over the past weekend. And we'll talk about the big game coming up against the Vancouver Whitecaps. And guys, it was a big weekend because Sporting Kansas City got a big win. KC Currents off to an undefeated start. The U.S. men's national team has uh, calmed all of my nervous anxiety that we talked about last week, Jacob. Told you so. Uh, so we're gonna <laughs> we're, we're gonna get to all of it, and uh, and let's go ahead and start there because we're gonna spend the bulk of the show talking about Sporting Kansas City. Like I said, the big win against RSL and everything that's that's coming up for the team. But uh, the United States, they get a nil nil down in Mexico. Could have, maybe should have won that game. They come back 5-1 over Panama. That means that on Wednesday, tomorrow, as we're recording this right now, uh, all they got to do is not get beat 6 nothing, and they are going to Qatar. What, what has been your takeaway, Jacob, of the performance by the national team over these last couple games? Well, first, I'm glad that your nerves are calmed down from last week. And I was thinking about Nate the whole time. Honest. If I'm being honest, I was like, I hope that Nate is okay, no matter what happens in this game. Yeah. And I mean, I told you, right? You it, did. It, you told me. Just the form that Mexico was in, and you said it there, I actually thought that performance was so good going down. Very hostile place, full stadium, right? Back uh, for the first time, I think, since uh, the pandemic, or at least one of the few first times. Um, and they, I thought for the majority of that game, probably until 80th minute or so, they like they decided to, to bunker in right. basically in the 80th minute up until that point. But I think also, you know, Adams was on a yellow card mm -hmm. at that point. You mm -hmm. want to take him out. I understand some of the, the substitutions there. Um, and then just coming home and just putting it on Panama. And I, I texted you guys this, but how about, I know that Kristen Pulisic got the hat trick, which was obviously great, and that third goal was phenomenal. But, you know, who set up that, that scoreline for them? Were the MSL players, MLS players, as uh, I'll officially <laughs> Inside say joke. it. Inside joke. <laughs> um, but the MLS the players. The MLS. Um, yes. They were the ones that carried the team. I mean, Paul Ariola scoring a goal with his head, which, as they say on really the broadcast, he never does. Um, mm -hmm. But Walker Zimmerman getting fouled for the penalty. Jesus Ferreira. And I think that as much as, yes, there are great players playing over in Europe, which which is what we all want to see, like let's not forget that there are a lot of good players here still playing domestically across this league. And I think that that's great for the national team as a whole. Well, and something that I found really interesting is, you know, someone actually did a, a deep dive into how many minutes those European guys have even played throughout these qualifiers. And it's really not a lot. And so I think when I look at – what this process has been like in the U.S. national team right now, literally on the doorstep of, of qualifying, it's just how much depth has had to get them here and, and how it's not just about this A team that we always talk about. It's not just about these European players. It's about a, a roster that has been comprised of so many different guys who have played a pivotal role in getting the U.S. to this point, which is going to hopefully carry them a really, really long way. And Greg Berhalter had a really – good quote, but he said that the biggest thing that he's learned is that you're never going to have your best team. And as soon as he came to terms with that, we were just more peaceful about it and more intentional about that next man up mentality, which I think when you're able to fully take that on as a coach, you can just more authentically convey that message across your entire team. And, and those guys played as if it was an X-Man up mentality. I literally tweeted out, I was like, everyone delete your tweets about Paul Ariel, like right now. <laughs> I mean, this, this, that game, it wasn't necessarily pretty at times, but they went out and they got the job done and it took a lot of different players to do it. MLS represent. And, and I mean, I don't think, uh, I think this isn't a controversial statement. We've never had this amount of depth yeah. for the U.S. Nope. national team. And, and just, you can go to guys down the roster. I mean, John Luca Busio, you know, got into to the Panama game. I mean, he's, playing in Syria right now. Yeah, they're fighting for relegation, but Eric Palmer Brown, which congrats to him, obviously getting down there, coming into a, a tough place. I thought he did well for really his first like true meaningful cap with the U.S. team at the Azteca, getting a point, 
to secure or help secure, hopefully, like I would, qualification. Like, I mean, that that's just a big-time performance. And you could go on and on just about how many good players and all, all the good players who, who aren't even on this roster. Mm-hmm. So that, that I think that speaks to just how deep the U.S. pool is. And I'm excited, you know, go down to, to Costa Rica, get the result that, that we need. But I'm excited for the World Cup, and I'm even more excited for the World Cup at home in yeah. 2026. Just these young group, man, it, it's going to be exciting. And do you want me to hop in real quick with the, the clinching scenario for the U.S.? Do it. So they can, with a win or a tie at Costa Rica, clinch, or a loss by less than – Six to nothing. So hopefully that is not the case for the U.S. They could just forfeit. Um, if they forfeit, they it'd just be a three nothing loss, and then they'd move on. But we're not going to do that because we're Americans. Yes, and then at worst, fourth is secured. But of course, yeah. they want to finish top three. Yeah, and I think they're going to go down to Costa Rica and take care of business. My nerves, and, and we talked about this at the time. My nerves were not really a reflection of what I think of this team. If anything, I was more nervous because of how much I believe in what this team can do in Qatar. I'm just nervous about getting there. I just was was winding myself up thinking about all the possible nightmare scenarios. You did a great job of calming me down on that last uh, week, Jacob, on the show. But it was actually doing the the uh, 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 the Blue Testament podcast this week that I know you've been a, a guest on both of you before, and and I got finally to make my debut the other day. Not to plug any other podcast. You, you, I always listen yeah, to this. You've made it though. I Good finally job. made it. I finally I finally made it. But we were talking about this, and it, it, it occurred to me I. What I like so much about this group, Peter Vermees talks all the time about the four components to a player being physical, mental, technical, and tactical. And in my opinion, through most of my life in which I've watched the U.S. play, and I think actually represent itself pretty well in the World Cup over the years, the two things that the U.S. always brought was the mental and the physical part. All of the trash takes about the, if our best athletes played soccer, the physicality, the athleticism has always been a strength of the American teams that I've watched at the World Cup. And the mentality. They're tough. They're gritty. They're, they're a little spunky. You know, they, they've got some fight to them, and, and they, don't, they, they are not easy to beat. Um, I think they lost that during the last World Cup qualifying campaign. The mentality was poor on that team. Um, what, what was always lacking in the past, in my opinion, was the technical and tactical components compared to the best teams in the world. This group technically is the best group we've ever had. They, they, these kids have a skill level that I don't, we haven't seen from top to bottom before. And they have a tactical awareness, understanding of the game because of the way they've been brought up playing it that we haven't seen before. And they're combining it with the mentality that the Americans always had that made me proud to be an American fan. Those guys had some fight to them. They, they are willing to scrap down at the Azteca. They're willing to scrap with the, the, those Panamanian players. So you tell me, Jacob, am I, do you see that in these guys? Because that's actually, I love guys that are skilled and can play, but I want guys that have that American spirit to them, and these guys seem to have that. Yeah, I do, and I think we say it on the broadcast, right? I've had so many coaches who say to you, first you have to outwork them, and mm-hmm. then you can outplay them. Mm-hmm. And if, but if you don't have that first component, if you're not going to outwork the team or at least match them um, just with, with the physicality, but more just, just the heart, yeah, then it doesn't matter how good you are. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, it, honestly, it doesn't in, in soccer. You have to have that. You have to, yeah, if, okay, you can have a messy maybe floats around, but like, you go back and watch Messi when, when his younger days. He, the way that he pressed was yeah. incredible. It, yeah. It's not just you, you have to have that first component, and you know that's I think the the fear right with with the younger group, the, the guys who have gone through academy systems all around the the mm-hmm. country. These beautiful facilities now, um, where when I was coming up, we had. <laughs> I mean, this was a pipe dream. There was I, yeah. I, this wasn't even fathomable at the time. Now this that we being have where this, we are doing the show yes, right now, Compass yes, Minerals, yes, yeah, yes. Um, nice plug. And yeah. but you, the fear is that you would lose that willingness to, hey, guys, we we might not have the the best setup. We not might not have the best skilled players, but we're gonna outwork this team. We're gonna go. And, and I think there's been moments, truthfully, in the past I don't know, five years or so, where you. You haven't seen that. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and it, even after, I think, after 
the disaster down in Trinidad. Um, I, I still think there's been games where, okay, does this does this young guy really have that fighting spirit? But I think recently, I, I think we definitely have, and, and everybody that's involved there. Now, when you when you're so close to qualifying to, I mean, if you can't get up for this, then yeah, what's wrong with you, right? right. Well, I, I thought it was so cool after the game because, of course, Pulisic was the only player who had that experience from that horrible game that we will not speak of in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, there was like a really cool image of him after the match there compared to this and, and then just seeing his role in helping the team in this most recent game. I, I do wonder how much, and I know that most of the messaging coming out of anyone within the U.S. national team organization has been, you know, we're not thinking about that. Like, we, we would just want to go out and qualify. But I, I would want to know, like, what does Christian Pulisic say having had that experience? Because I do think that there's got to be some sort of experience that he can relay to help that group as well. But I do think that if we're looking collectively at the group, the mentality that we've seen across the board now, top down with the depth that this, that this organization, you know, that this team has, um, they have the right mentality. And that was, that was the missing piece for sure. There's, there's an edge to them. And when it comes to Pulisic, that kid has been through a lot, mm -hmm. both good and bad. He went through that qualifying campaign disaster in Cuba. He's won a UEFA Champions League. He's also had stretches where he's had recurring injuries and people have openly in the most brutal media markets in the world questioned whether or not he's got what it takes. You know, what is he worth the money? Can can he stand up to the rigors of that league? He's you know, he's had the the pressure of being the guy to try to supposedly carry this team, which I actually believe is a complete fallacy because there are so many other good players around him. Weston McKinney has had things like getting sent home at the beginning of the qualifying campaign for not having the proper attitude, which I, by the way, think Greg Berhalter might have done a, the most masterful job of managing that situation that he could to get the production out of McKinney that he has down the road. Your guy, Tyler Adams, I'll call him our guy because I, I freaking love Tyler Adams. He has an edge to him that he's learning how to manage a little bit. Because I thought early in this qualifying campaign, he got himself in trouble a couple of times with, with emotionally irresponsible fouls and things like that. This time around in the Panama thing, he was kind of the one making sure that, that Christian didn't do anything that got himself in trouble. And, I mean, these are young guys that are figuring out this process, this balance of having that edge but keeping their composure at the same time. And I actually think it's really, really fun to watch them kind of grow up in front of our own eyes. And that's basically what we are doing, right? We're watching yeah. these guys. I mean, just to think about the the pressure that, that Christian Pulisic has been under. I, I mean, the, the kid has been just incredible, everything that he's done. And that third goal was masterful in just a little, great little turn. As Stu Holden just about lost his mind. And then, <laughs> you know, megging the other defender. And then calming himself down and slotting that one in i mean yeah it, it, you said it but there are just you could go on weston tyler there are so many good players here and they're playing they're playing at the best clubs in the world and that's awesome to see and then and like you said then there's also jesus ferreira ricardo pepe the the anchors of the defense miles robinson and walker zimmerman right here in major league soccer that are delivering i mean the defensive performances i think have been have been completely underrated through the course of this qualifying so campaign so good. and they've been they've been anchored by by guys that are playing right here in this league which is pretty amazing as well all right uh we just had a, a handsome man with a wry smile walk in here who's ready to do an interview with us. So we're going to go ahead and take a break. And it's not Connor McCourt, who is also here as well, though, by the way. Uh, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, Johnny Russell, the captain, will join us as we are presented by Michelob Ultra. It's only worth it if you enjoy it. And we are back for another edition of the Sporting Kansas City Show on your home for SKC Soccer, Sports Radio 810 WHB, wherever you get your podcasts and wherever you stream your video content, be it on YouTube or wherever else, you can see the, the wonderful cans of Michelob Ultra that have been strategically placed in front of our next guest, Johnny Russell. Michelob Ultra, it's only worth it. If you enjoy it, we are joined now by the captain of Sporting Kansas City, man that's coming off a big goal and a big win against Real Salt Lake over the weekend. Johnny Russell here. How are you, man? I'm good, man. I'm good. Thank you. How are you? I'm good, and I will say this. The, uh, the, the best part of the night, Saturday was a great night because needed to get back on the winning side of things, and uh, it, was, it was another big 1-0. We will talk about the importance of getting those 1-0 results in a minute. 
but Jacob Alley and I got the honor of meeting the Russell family. Uh, your brothers, your mom, your dad, they're all here in town, and uh, it was really fun to get a chance to talk with them. What's, uh, how is it having them here, you know, having everybody in, in town? Um, it's been good. I mean, they got in late uh, Friday night before the game, um, and that's the first time they've been out since... 18. My dad hasn't been out here, uh, but the rest of them, it's the first time they've been able to get out since 18. So, no, I think they're enjoying it as well, and it's just it's just good to have them around. It's you know it's familiar, um, and it's just good having extra bodies in the house. Um, you know, especially always, with those little kids yeah, running putting around. Putting them to exactly, work, I bet. Yeah. Exactly. So <laughs> it gives you a little bit of a break uh, at times, and no, it's just good to have people around them. You know, I'm a type of person that likes to have people around me, so no, it's just good to have them here. And you've got a big family too, so I'm sure the the house is is pretty full right now. Are they all staying with you guys? They're all staying. They're all staying in the house. I'm um, still got sisters back home, um, and she's married and got three kids as well. So big family. Um, what was it like growing up in a big family? You're the oldest, right? We oldest we bonded over this because we're both the oldest of four kids. Oldest of so four. So what was that like in the Russell household? I mean, it was it was good. Me and my sister are pretty close. There's like a year, year and a half between us, and then a bit of a gap between. Me and my oldest brother, and then the youngest one's just about to turn 21, actually, when we're here, so I think a few, oh, of, the, I think a few of the boys want to take him out, so <laughs> that'll be that'll be fun, but uh, no, it's it was good, I, I enjoyed my, my childhood growing up, and I think that's probably why so much now, I, I just sort of enjoy, enjoy being around like so many people, because I'm, I'm used to it, I don't like, you know, being on my own, spending time on my own, I, I like to do things in a group, so probably comes from that yeah i think uh, i think we're all on the same page there because i come from a big old uh, catholic family and i like the chaos you know, we have three kids ourselves and i a lot of my friends are like what were you thinking going for a third kid and, and my, i'm like i like the i like the mess i like everybody being loud and having fun and my wife comes from a small family and i think sometimes she's like i need to get out of here you know <laughs> there's there's a little bit of loudness to it but um was the family loud like did was big loud family growing up or how was it um yeah i think it, it was pretty loud um you know we've got a lot of cousins as well so we spent a lot of weekends with them so it was yep. just there was you know any time there's probably like 10 of us you know kids just running around so yeah i think that's i think that's like i said earlier that's why i enjoy being in you know groups just constantly being used to it and that's how i grew up but you know i, I don't think I think I'm done. I don't think I'm having any more. No. Uh, well, no, we'll see. Uh, we'll see. Uh, I think it's it's just too difficult um, <laughs> b being away. You know, it's, yeah. it's good that they're here. Um, it's so much more manageable. So if I was back home, probably, but not when it's just a... The two little psychos <laughs> yeah. running rings around you. It's, uh, it's too much. So, so one thing I wanted to ask you about with the family here, because... Um, I had the, I, I've been lucky enough to go visit Scotland a couple of times. That's where my ancestors are from on my mom's side. I took my wife there once. I took my mom and my sister there once. And one of the things that stood out to me so much was there was this like civic pride of a lot of times when you're American and you go to other countries in Europe, they kind of treat you like they wish you weren't there. When I was in Scotland, it seemed like everybody wanted to know, how do you like it here? How have you liked your stay? Like, people were very concerned. They wanted you, they were proud of Scotland, and they wanted you to say that you enjoyed it. Mm. And that's how I feel as a Kansas Cityan. When your family comes here, the first thing I want to know is, do you guys like it here? Are you having a good time? Is everything okay? Do you see any similarities in the people when it comes to that at all? They're like the pride of, of where they're from and hoping that people like it when they're here? Yeah, I mean, I think we are very... You know, patriotic. We love our country. Uh, we want people to have a good time when they're there. So, you know, if someone's in your company, then you want to make sure that they have the best time possible. And I feel like it has been like that for me here. You know, wherever I've been, you know, people look out for you and they always give you suggestions on places to go. I mean, I've been here for, you know, like four and a half years now. So it's, you know, I kind of know my way about, um, you know, a lot better than I did. But even now, you get people coming up to you. You know, asking you certain things, how you're enjoying it, and just giving you little suggestions on different places to go and things that they like. So there is definitely similarities there. So I'll kind of weave in. I asked people on Twitter what their questions were for you. One of them was, what is your favorite thing about KC outside the club? So what is your favorite thing about Kansas City outside the club? Is it the people, or are there any things about living here that you just you really love? No, the people have, the people have been great. I think people are really nice here. Um, 
you know, when I came to the US as sort of a tourist on vacations, you always go to places like New York where people don't really have time for you. <laughs> yeah. So it's, uh, <laughs> to come here, it's it's nice, it's refreshing. Um, the people are great. Um, I love being in the sun. The summers here are a little bit too crazy. Um, I think the golf courses are beautiful as well. So no, there's just a mixture of things that I really like here. Yeah, Nate, you can talk about the golf. Yeah, we we've actually been trying to get you guys out yeah. while you're here. Yeah, so you are do you do you is that one of your favorite things to do with your leisure time is go play golf? Yeah, I don't play it nearly as much as I would like, um, but it's that's something that I, I really do enjoy. Um, you know, it's just whenever I do get a bit of free time, you usually spend it with the kids. You know, we travel quite a lot, so I try and spend as much of that doing stuff with them. Um, but when I do get a bit of time off, whether they're at school or not, then I do. I do like to get out, and I'm going to try to do it a lot more this year as well. So if you grow up in Scotland, is that are you just, like, given a set of golf clubs? I mean, that's the birthplace of the sport. I've been to St. Andrews. I didn't play. Those courses look really difficult to me. It's just windy, and it's long and all that. Did you did you play a lot growing up? Not a lot growing up because I just constantly played I just constantly played football, so you know, I didn't really have time for anything yeah. else. Literally every, every spare moment I had went into this. Um, so I didn't play it. A lot. My dad, like you spoke to him, my dad was a really good golfer, played off scratch for years um, and probably could have and should have took it further, but chose not to. Um, so why didn't he Why did he choose not to? I don't know. Um, I've never actually fully asked him. Um, I, think he, I think he said the travelling as well, he'd be away from us a lot, so maybe that had something to do with it. It's something that I, I will need to ask him. Um, but no, I'd grown up, I didn't play it. I didn't play it a lot. It's only really since I started playing professionally where you get a little bit of free time where I started to take it up. What's your uh, What's the club you need to work on the most? Um, I think mine's all going. of them. So yeah, okay. <laughs> I mean, driving can be a bit erratic at times. I can I can nail one off the tee or I can hit the biggest left to right you've ever seen. So it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a work in progress. But, yeah, uh, I think my my short game's pretty good. Um, but the the rest of it, I need to work on that. One of the other questions we got from the audience, because you, you've brought up uh, the wee man, as, as you call your son. And what do you call your daughter? Is she the wee lassie or the wee? No, I just uh, <laughs> got a diff- bunch of different names. Yeah. Well, I know you've got yeah. the bee tattoo. You yeah. call her bee. Oh, yeah. Bee, uh, yeah. bee um, Blake, call her my girl, just whatever. Okay, so yep. the, the, the question we got from the audience was, are you into coaching any youth sports yet, or, or are you going to be? Um, I'm not doing it yet. Obviously, this year it's great that we can get back out and you know the sort of COVID restrictions have lifted, so we can get back out and do the little you know camps and stuff this year. So I'm looking forward to that. But I haven't really got into coaching. Um, I don't think it's for me. Obviously, if if my kids take it up, um, then I'll hundred percent get involved in that. But it's it's not something I see myself you know doing after I'm done. Is is taking taking any sort of coaching role so like I said if, if my kids decide this is what they want to do then I'll 100% get involved in that but that's, that's probably as far as I'll take it. So you say if they get involved you're not gonna you're not like putting a soccer ball in front of them all the time right now trying to? Uh, no I mean if, of course I want them to want them to play but you know if they choose to do something else and they've got my full back and they do that whatever makes them happy. Um, my daughter's at an age right now we're trying her in a bunch of different sports to see what it is that she likes so Obviously, she's tried football, she tried tennis, um, gymnastics, getting her into martial arts right now. Um, so just let her try a bunch of different things um, and see what it is that she likes. I mean, growing up, I didn't have all those options. You know, I had I had football, that was it. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So everything I had went into that, but you never know. Maybe I would, if I'd tried something else, um, I might have been good at that, so... No, just whatever it is that they want to do, then, you know, you just just want to support them and, and that. Okay, so let, you come, because that's kind of how it is in America, right? Like, I played everything growing up, and maybe that's why I wasn't good at anything. <laughs> you know, but I, I could play, I could kind of pick up any ball and play it a little bit. Um, have you seen one here that you're like, boy, if, if I had been taught that early, I would have been really good. Is there anything that stands out? Um, no, not really. There's not anything that I watch and be like, I wonder what it'd be like. I think it'd be, I think I would have liked to try, obviously, American football. 
um, when I was younger, but obviously we just don't have that mm -hmm. over here. But obviously if I grew up here, then that's something I probably would have tried. Um, but apart from that, no, I don't really look at anything else and be like, oh, I wonder if I, I could have been good at that or I want to try that. No. So when you were growing up, who was like kind of that? You said you put everything into playing football. Mm. Who was driving that? Was it all you just kind of going out and doing it on your own? I think that's the other interesting thing about a lot of kids that grow up playing an American sport. Like the parents are really like hardcore driving it oftentimes. Was that the same thing for you? Not really. I was never never really pressured into it or sort of drove into it. My mom drove me everywhere, all over uh, the country. Um to make sure I got to trainings or games, so mm -hmm. she put, put a lot of time into it. Um, so she was definitely one of the the driving factors in that. But it was never, it was never pressured. It was me, me constantly wanting to do it. It was kind of, kind of like an obsession where you just constantly want to do it. Any any time that I could, I always had a ball, um, and I was always working on something. I was playing with my friends, or I was training, or if I was on mowing, I would do the same thing. So it was. I think that sort of drive and pressure came from me, not from anywhere else. I always think it's fascinating listening to soccer players, where they grew up and how that affected the type of player they became. You just mentioned playing with your friends. When I watch you play, the, I mean, there's so many great things about you as a player, but the, the part that I think the people love the most is Johnny's got the ball on his foot, and he's got a guy lined up, and he's running at him because he's going to do something to turn this guy inside out. And maybe it's two guys. It almost seems to me sometimes, sometimes like more. <laughs> you like having two guys in front of you. Um, and I always wonder, like, did that come from – I grew up playing a lot of street basketball. And when you play organized basketball and the coach is on you, you're constantly focused on running the system. But when you're playing with your buddies in the playground, that's when you try to, I'm going to see if I can break this guy's ankles. You know, I'm going to see if I can turn this guy inside out. You try things because you just want to have one over on your buddy. That's what I picture when I see you. I'm like, this guy must have been just a nightmare on the playground with his friends. Is that where that came from? Pretty much. Um, playground, after school. Um, we just constantly played games or done stuff to try and, get, like you say, get one over on your friend. You know, if you could embarrass your friend doing something and then bring it up later. Yeah. You know, that's what that's what we live for and we constantly tried that. So I think that's where that sort of aspect of my game definitely comes from. Um, you know, we played a lot of, like, individual games, so we don't have enough bodies to play, you know, like a, like a team game. So it would be sort of one goalkeeper and then basically, like, the next five guys would be, it would be one-on-one, -on -one, like, with yeah. each other. So you, you were constantly... One guy had the ball, the other four guys had to get the ball. So that's where that probably came from, where you have to learn, obviously, if you want to get a shot off and go, or you have to adapt it, you have to find a way to get around, you know, not just one guy, but there's constantly, you beat one guy, there's always going to be someone else there. So I think that's always been because of the way I grew up and the way we played. That's probably why it's always been there. Okay, so another question that somebody had was, you know, when we talk about, you going one on one or one v two, or who's been the hardest MLS defender that you've gone up against, or or a guy that maybe even not MLS, just that's really been tough in those situations. Um, that's a good one, actually. I know. I was like, that's a great question, because it. I don't. I, I wouldn't really single anyone out, saying that they're really difficult. Um, you know, you play against guys. I feel like all the guys are difficult to play against. They all, you know, have different strengths. Um, you have to constantly adapt your game to who you're playing against because sometimes certain things that might be my strong point don't really work against a certain player, so you have to change it. I can always remember growing up, so I was a young guy, and I'm sure it was we played against Hearts. It was like in the reserve league, and I played against a guy, um, uh, Goncalves, and he was just a monster. You could not get round the guy. Um, that, that's always one that stuck with me. Because um, I was so young as well. I was only like 17, 18 at the time. But just constantly when I went to play against him, I was just like, this is this is going to be a tough day. Um, and it's always stuck with me. But no, I've, I always go into a game 
you know, respecting the guy that I'm going to be up against. My objective going into the game is like I want to mentally and physically destroy the guy. Um, but you know, they all bring their own challenges. So you know that I would never go into a game thinking, "Oh, this is going to be mm-hmm. this is going to be a walk in the park." Um, you know, I've always got that respect for people, and like I said, there's so many guys in the league that bring different challenges. Some guys love to bomb the other way, so that brings challenges in itself. You yeah. have to track them so you can't get the ball in situations that you want. So, I mean, there's, def- there's definitely a lot of guys in the league that do that. So you say you want to destroy them mentally and physically. Is it, can you can you figure out with the body language of a guy? I've, I've got I'm in this guy's mind right now. I'm in his head, and now and now it's time to go at him. Yeah, you you know when you broke a guy. Um, you know it can just be subtle little things like you said, body language or a way that they move, or if you get the ball, certain body positions they take, or they give you a bit more space than they have been. Um, you just know that there's a, a certain point, and that doesn't always happen. I'm not saying that happens every game, but you know, for me, it's it's a great feeling when you've played to a certain level uh, and you've seen someone's, you know, been affected by it. Um, and like you said, that's when you know you've got them, and you just continue to go at them. You constantly want the ball, and just constantly want to go at them. When did you like learn that? Because I feel like that's not something that you're just going to know uh, early on in your career. So at what at what point did you really like start figuring out that mental side of it? Um. I don't know, probably throughout school and then playing sort of in the, the youth academies and stuff like that. Um, the When I played sort of like boys club growing up, you knew then as well, like some of the games you went into um, and some of the things that you could hear the coach saying or other players saying to their player. Um, and then that just sort of carried on. You just, I don't know, it's just a feeling you get, you know, when someone's someone's struggling, um, and that's when you know I sort of thrive. I love that. Um, we were talk- I was actually talking about this the other day. That sort of competitive side where you know I I pretty much play the game to to obviously destroy someone. That's why I'm, I I play. Um, so I think just constant repetition, constant experience of it. Um, you kind of get a kind of get a feeling of when you've got someone. Destroy mind, body, spirit. It's like, <laughs> <Correct>. <laughs> we're break you down. I know I got a little bit dark there. Yeah, but. yeah, yeah no, I, no, I, no, I like it. Um, the mind of Johnny Russell. I love the fact that your daughter's doing martial arts because I'm learning more and more about that sport. And there's, I mean, there's every bit as much of mental uh, sport as it is a physical sport. And, and you see it. I mean, like I said, I can see when I'm sitting upstairs, you get a guy lined up and I can tell all of a sudden if a guy's like, He's worried about getting beat. He starts to backpedal before he even, you know, tries to close you down. And and it, you can just – and I'm sure you can read those things. But I want to ask you about another mental part of the game. So, last game against RSL, you had a moment like that. You skinned at least two guys, and you get into the penalty area, and you get right on the six-yard box, and the ball's on your left foot, and it goes into the stands. And I saw – the look on your face, like you're like, I just did the hardest part and I didn't get a goal out of it. And you were mad. Like you were mad. I don't know if you're mad at yourself or frustrated or what, but you could tell that you were upset by it. You come back and you get the game winning goal a little bit later. Can you tell me what goes on in your mind when you have a moment that doesn't go the way that you want? You know, what were you thinking in that moment when you looked so angry? And then how do you respond from it the rest of the way of the game? No, I was just frustrated and angry at myself. Um, like you said, I'd, I'd done the hardest part. Uh, I got the two, de- two defenders into the ex- exact situation I wanted them. I always knew I was going to go through them, so I just tried to delay it long enough where the centre-back dropped and gave me the space. Done that, and then the defenders done actually a really good job at blocking the low one because I was just going to go bottom corner, and he's got down early. And then I tried to go high, and just whip it around them, but I've just caught it all wrong. And I said that was the most frustrating part. I've caught myself in that situation so many times. I do it every day in practice. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I've got the repetition there. I know exactly what I want to do. And then in the most important moment, I didn't pull it off. So it was just anger at myself. For obviously, it was such a a vital moment for for the team as well. Um, you know, that's our big chance, and obviously, it felt to me which. You know, I would like it to fall to me. I want to obviously be the one that takes 
you know, those moments. Um, and it was just sort of anger, frustration, disappointment at myself, but I'm never one to dwell on it. Like, I take a few seconds, I'm angry at myself, but then your head's got to switch back on because I know I'm going to get another chance or I'll provide another chance. So I have to be at the top of my game, I have to be on it mentally as well. Um, so it's just a natural reaction, you're going to get you're going to get angry, you're going to get frustrated, but you need to switch it straight back on um, and be ready to go again. And like you said, I get the chance later. Sort of similar position in the, in the goal. Obviously, I was a little bit further out and a little bit more to the left, but same sort of scenario. Um, so it was just about, you know, taking it early, keeping it low there as well. Um, and obviously, luckily for me, that one went in. So, you know, you, you can get away with... You know those sort of chances if you know you win the game, but obviously if that's a moment for us to win the game, I don't take it and we tie the game. Then that's that's down to me. That's my fault. Um, so it is just like you said, it's it's switching back on to to know when you're in that situation again. You know you have to bury it. And I was actually thinking at the time as well about going round the guy, so the guy slides into block. I was thinking about going round him again, but I was like, don't want to go. You know, take it too far and yeah. try and take it round everyone yeah. and yeah. not get the shot off. Uh huh. So I just tried to take it, not early, but as I went to take it, I got a little nudge and it just slightly took me off balance and just caught the ball, caught the ball wrong. Um, but I, I said after the game that, in my opinion, that should be a goal every single time I get in that situation. So that's probably why I was so angry about it. Can be a game of inches sometimes. But as we're talking about like Johnny Russell scoring goals, it made me think: What is your favorite goal from your time here at Sporting? Because you've had a lot of great ones. Um, I don't know. I th the Galaxy goal in '18 that secured playoffs. That one always sticks out in my mind. I like the the goal against Seattle last year, mm -hmm. um, the away one where we get all the passes and then yeah. Roger plays yeah. me through. Um, just team goal. What the what the game meant, obviously, there was a bit of, you know, it was a bit heated before that, and, you know, they they came and won here, um, it was a big result for them, and they probably felt that they were sort of gone past mm -hmm. us, so that was a massive result for us to get back. Yeah. Um, so that, that one probably uh, sticks out a bit more. Obviously, getting the one a couple last year as well, breaking the Scottish record, mm -hmm. you know, getting the... the the goal in eight, eight consecutive games, you know, things, yeah. like, things like that. Those little ones mean something to me, but if I was probably to pick one of the goals, it'd be Galaxy or the Seattle one last year. We just, like, recently, by the yeah. way, as we're, like, doing a lot of breakdowns with this, like, Coach Paint stuff, we broke down the Seattle goal in our pregame show last week, and we've got that Galaxy one uh, in the uh, in the bank right now, ready to go. So uh, we're, we're right there with you. We agree. Those were great goals. You know, I, I remember saying at the time, you know, it's not Johnny Russell against the world. It's Johnny Russell taking on the entire galaxy. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> dad jokes. I'm here for the dad jokes. That's what I do. Uh, Johnny, Jacob shaking his yeah, head Yeah, Jacob's just absolutely disgusted by my behavior. He's not happy with that. No, he doesn't. Like, if I, I actually kind of have to duck when I say something like that during the game because I'm afraid Jacob might, you know. Take off his headset yeah. and walk away. Yep, yep. Um, hey, Johnny, it's, it's great to have you and your family here. I hope, we, we do hope you guys all love it here and uh, we look forward to talking again real soon. Thanks, man. It was good to be on. All right, that is Johnny Russell, and we're presented by Michelob Ultra. It's only worth it if you enjoy it. I'm going to have to be careful because Jacob is joining us again after this segment, and he might have some words for me for, uh, for that terrible dad joke. Back after this. And we are back on this edition of the Sporting Kansas City Show to wrap things up, presented by Michelob Ultra. It's only worth it if you enjoy it. Ali Trost with me and rejoined by Jacob Peterson. Our thanks to Johnny Russell, the captain, for joining us on the show today. I know, Jacob, you were you were listening in on that, despite my terrible uh, play on words at the end. What did you think of what the what Johnny had to say? Anything stand out to you? Well, I, I think just overall, any I mean, we talk any interview with Johnny is a good interview. Um, it's not just one, two sentences. He expands mm -hmm. on stuff. Um, but I think here it's just getting to, to know more of his, his family and that whole thing. And he said it's, uh, it, was, it was fun to meet them um, and sometimes understand them. <laughs> um, but uh, it, uh, it, it's always nice to see that personal side of, of guys. Yeah. 
No, yeah. it, it, I, I think the thing that I enjoyed the most about our conversation with him just now is just learning a little bit more about what it was like for him growing up playing soccer because I think it's so fascinating to hear different athletes experience and for him just the impact that that backyard soccer kind of still has on his style of play today not just in the actual like technical side but in the mental side as well like I didn't really you know realize the depths of of just how much Johnny thinks about that and, and in real time the one-on-one -on -one matchups and, and you see how well he does in those moments in the game you know on the ball but also what's going on in his head too so I thought it was really interesting to kind of hear him really elaborate on on what he thinks about and how you can now as a as a for us media and as you know a viewer kind of see see yeah. that and it, it was just really cool to hear him expand on that that's that's when he's in those moments where he can run at guys he looks like a kid on the playground to me. That's that's what I see, and and it's it's fun to watch. It was good. To, it was good to hear that story. All right, let's let's get into it, guys. This game coming up against uh, the Vancouver Whitecaps this weekend. Sporting coming off a big win at home, looking for results on the road, Jacob, and that's something that they were really really good at last year. They've only had three cracks at it so far this year. There's been a lot of extenuating circumstances and all that. But are they fancying that, like, hey, this is a chance to go on the road and get a result here uh, for the first time in 2022? Yeah, I mean, every game is a chance to go out there and, and get a result. And going on the road, it's difficult. And it's almost because since Peter Vermees has taken over, we're almost spoiled because of how good of their record on the road consistently year mm -hmm. after year. Because, I mean... We, we talk about every time Houston Dynamo come, right? Uh, Houston Dynamo have maybe five wins over Which is 10 crazy. years on the road. Yeah. Um, it's also why you see such good road support for this team because, you know, fans can expect really good games anytime that Sporting Kansas City hits the road. Yeah, and, and this season going to Atlanta, 65,000 fans, tough altitude in Colorado, always a difficult pl place to go. Especially with the the way that Colorado's team is constructed, with being so defensive and absorbing pressure, uh, and then the Chicago game, we know just all the injuries and, and all of that. But Vancouver, I mean, that's it's not like it's an easy place to go play. Uh, it's my least favorite place to go. Not not from a city, awesome city, awesome beautiful city. city. Yeah. It, it's incredible, but that stadium. Uh, I, I, it just smells like wet dog every time you go in there. <laughs> wow, Jacob, it, I'm really excited for my first trip. It, really it, the turf is not good. Um, it's a dome, which is just, I, I don't think, unless it's Atlanta, and even then, like I, I don't think dome should be where you play soccer games. Um, it, and they've been good. Like I mean, last season, we talked about this on, on our call earlier this week, but because of the COVID situation last year, they didn't have a home game, a true home game in at BC Place until I think it was almost August. Yeah. And in that time, they were since then. They last season they were seven one and one on the road, and then they tied their first game to NYCFC, who's the defending MLS Cup champ. So yes, their their record isn't great, and they've gotten beat up pretty bad on the road. I mean, similarly to Sporting. But at home, they, it's a completely different team, and, and it's tough to go there. They should probably be getting some guys back from injury, depending on Brian White, uh, Ryan Gold as well. But, uh, I mean, it's a tough place to go play. Like, I, I don't think people realize how difficult it is to play on that turf, to play in that, that dome. Even sometimes the environment's good with the fans, sometimes it's not. But that noise just echoes around, and, and it's, a, it's a tough, tough place to go play. Yeah, I, this is the first time for me, so I'm interested. You're a big sushi fan, so you're going to have some sushi while I you're am there? A, yeah, I am a big sushi fan, you so I'll, I'll check okay. it out. I need to, it's the I oysters, need to like, right? Oh, that's the, it's that's the oyster, yeah, yeah, oysters are not my ugh, not, okay. not my cup of tea. So, but you, but you'll but do sushi, the, I'll, do, okay. I'll do sushi. There's some good, there's, there's great, there's all kinds of great stuff to do in Vancouver. It's going to be a lot of fun. Jake mentioned a couple guys, Brian White and Ryan Gold. We don't know if they're going to be back or not, but... They had that run to close out the season mm -hmm. last year, and, and Vanny Sartini, the head coach, he's he's a wonderful character, and he's got all this positive enthusiasm, and he's fun to listen to talk and all that. But I feel like those two players 
were a huge component to the run that they made. So it's going to be interesting to see if they're available in this game or not. Yeah, and you know, similarly for Sporting Kansas City, who will they have available? Mm -hmm. I mean, they've got guys working back from injury, and, and we've seen before Peter Vermees make decisions to, to hold guys back instead of sending them out on the road, playing you know, in an environment like you just mentioned where it's kind of weird turf. Is that the best game to, to really bring these guys back, playing a full 90 minutes? We saw Uri Rozell back in training uh, today on Tuesday for Sporting Kansas City, which is good news. So he's working back. But I think that's going to be interesting to see, you know, as the week kind of goes on, who's going to be available for, for both teams, really key players. Yeah. I, well, you mentioned it, but I was having this conversation with Uri a couple weeks ago. I've pulled my hamstring, I think, three times in my career. All three of those times were all on turf. Uri just did it in Atlanta on the turf. I don't know if that factors into it at all. Yeah. But – I have pulled my hamstring on that turf up in Vancouver, and it's it's just not it's just heavy. Your legs get so heavy when you're playing on there. Um, you know, we'll see his availability, but I think, I mean, regardless, it was good to get this last game to get Johnny and, and Daniel back, and to where you could see maybe early on there was a little bit rust that they they were working off, but. I mean, to get through that game and then to show up in the, in the big time moments, like I, I think that is a, a really big positive. And then also Kyrie came yeah. into that game, yeah. and you could kind of just ch tell um, how his presence out there kind of lifted the the whole group. Um, and that's not a knock on Nikola at all. It's just Kyrie kind of brings that presence out mm -hmm. there um, that it's really hard to emulate. So I think it's good that Sporting ha have at least those three guys back. And I mean, obviously we'll see what Uri is, but uh, at this point in the season. I always say it is I would much rather these guys take an extra week than to continually to, to get injured um, because that could last, you know, three, four months. And that's not what, what you want to do. OK, so one of the things that was fascinating last year when Vancouver came here in the playoffs and they had that big run and we talked a lot about Vanny Sartini said, we're going to go to Kansas City, we're going to beat them. And. That turned into bulletin board material. Uh, the sporting Kansas City coaches and players didn't make any bones about it. They used that as motivation. But to me, what was even more fascinating was the way that game played out. Because Vancouver had been a team that didn't want the ball all season. And sporting was one of the best teams, if not the best team, in the league in possession. So I was sure sporting was going to have 65 70% of the ball. And it was all going to come down to whether or not they took their chances or whether or not Vancouver could beat them on the counter. And the game played out completely opposite of that. And that was by design. And we found sporting decided to hit them with a, a change up in game plan. And it really worked. Is that on the mind of the Vancouver coaches and players when they come into this? Now, it's a game in Vancouver this time around, but like, there's got to be some cat and mouse that's going to be taking place going into this game, and I'm going to be fascinated to see how it plays out. Yeah, me too. Uh, of course. I mean, we're playing chess here, right? We're trying to figure out. I mean, you look at the, those two games from the, the regular season game that Sporting went up to, to Vancouver and lost to the one in the playoffs. I mean, the, the possession numbers are almost identically flipped mm -hmm. with about 63% possession um, flipping, which is odd for the home team to kind of see that much possession. But Vancouver this year, same thing. They're second to last, I think, in possession. In that NYCF game, NYCFC game, I think they only had 30% possession at home. So, man, I don't know. It's going to be we'll, – we'll, we'll know – 10 minutes into the game, maybe, yeah. Yeah. but it's going to be interesting, uh, both coaching staffs, because there's no doubt that, that that dynamic that you mentioned is in both both of these teams' minds. Yeah, well, and I mean, especially when we also consider, too, just like we talked about, who's available and how that impacts how sporting can play. As we saw, they went with a completely different formation on the road against Chicago, which was mostly due to the fact that they were missing their front three guys, who usually are the kind of the, the start up top, you know, for them with the 4 3, three and, and how they like to play. But, um, Jacob, like, when you look at what sporting, the adjustments that they've had to make early in this season and how maybe little of that they had last year, do, how much does that help them as the season goes on, getting new guys into the mix and, and kind of learning different ways to win? Yeah, it, it definitely helps. It, it helps. I think that was the, the thing last year is they just didn't have enough depth uh, on the team to sustain, uh, especially late on in the season when it was Wednesday, Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday. This year – I think they do. The the depth, the, the overall roster, I think, is so much deeper than it was last year, which is great uh, going forward. But, I mean, every game in MLS is, is difficult, and, and you're going to have to. It, it's nice to have weekend games basically all throughout, um, but you're still going to need to rely on, on guys um, 
you know, at least one through 20, maybe even, you know, farther than that. As we've seen, Sporting had 17 different starters, I think, already this season, which I think was second most in the league. Yeah. So they've, they've had to be, uh, rely on it. But I think that's the reason why they made some of these offseason moves. Um, and it, it's going to be interesting. And let's not forget uh, Thomas Hassall, right? He's He was the hero of yeah. the MLS's back game. Um, stood on his head for that Vancouver mm-hmm. team. And now he's the starting goalkeeper after uh, Crapo went down to LAFC. So we'll see if he can emulate or, or replicate some of that, that magic that he had down there. Well, won't see a penalty shootout in this one, you know, but, uh, but, but, but we'll see what happens in the, in the course of the game. And it's coming up 7 o'clock on Saturday, pre-match coverage on television at 6.30. You can, of course, watch it on 38 The Spot on SportingKC.com and the Sporting KC app as well. That's going to do it for us. We can't wait to see you Saturday night. Big game at Vancouver. Chance for Sporting to get their first away win of 2022 and jump right back up into the middle of the standings in the Western Conference as well. It's so early in the year, three points makes a big difference Mm -hmm. one way or the other. So for Allie Trost and Jacob Peterson and for Johnny Russell joining us on the show, this is Nate Katie saying thanks for listening and watching. We'll see you next time on the Sporting Kansas City Show presented by Michelob Ultra.